With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Salam and welcome to the Single Muslim Live, sponsored by SingleMuslim.com with me, Naza Katoon. We're live here on Sky 752 and across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Wherever you're watching, a very warm welcome. You too can join us in today's discussion and get advice by simply calling through to the studio on 019-2423-1083. Standard rates apply, so please make sure that you have the bill payers' permission before you call us. And why not share your thoughts with us on WhatsApp? in private and confidential on 079-5079-7017. Today's guest is Imam Habib, and the topic is retaining your identity during marriage. What an exciting topic we have today for you guys. Asalaamu Alaikum Habib. Wa oh, Alaikum Asalaamu How are you doing? I'm very well. Yourself? Alhamdulillah good. Alhamdulillah good. It's so nice to have you on here. We literally had a conversation on podcasts um, in regards to a few delicate topics around fitness and Islam and the Western society. And today's one goes straight into identity and how to retain your identity during marriage. And it's a very interesting topic we have here today because it's something most of us want to work on and it's a part of our personal development. But before I go in, Habib is a very exciting um, individual to me. Um, and I want him, Habib, to introduce himself, what he does, and actually how old he is and how he got into becoming a religious scholar as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, first of all, having me over. Uh, I think it was a great privilege for me to sort of get an invitation from you. Uh, with regards to this, so first of all, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to British Muslim TV and singlemuslim.com for organizing something like this. And I think it's very, very uh, important that we do discuss these sort of issues. Um, so yeah, so thank you, first of all. Uh, secondly, I don't want to sort of uh, talk a lot about myself, uh, but uh, just to give you a brief sort of intro as to who I am. Um, so my name is Habib. I'm originally from Sheffield, um, but currently uh, I'm studying at uh, the American University in Cairo uh, and I'm doing my master's in international human rights law and justice. Uh, previously to that, I studied a master's in Islamic and Middle Eastern studies uh, at, the Edinburgh, uh, at the Edinburgh University. Uh, before that, I studied uh, various institutes, uh, one uh, Jamia al Karam, which is an Islamic seminary, and that was pretty much my gateway to me becoming uh, someone involved within this field. Uh, and then after that, I went to the Cambridge Muslim College um, and mm -hmm. I studied with uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, who's known as Professor Timothy Winter, to a lot of people. Um, and that helped me, in a sense, to sort of contextualize further as to how we can deliver the message of Islam in the British context. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, apart from that, I have had an opportunity to serve as an imam in Scotland mm -hmm. uh, at Dunfermline Central Mosque. Uh, and currently, I just teach online. Uh, I do various courses online. Um, I teach Quran, uh, Islamic studies, uh, Duff and Nasheed, and you know, uh, various workshops on uh, certain issues, whether it's to do with uh, community issues or current affairs. Um, so, I mean, previously we just did um a workshop on the srebrenica genocide uh, so we had a little online memorial and uh, we had a five-day uh, sort of lessons or series of lectures and um, yeah. i think that was great to have so yeah and uh, i'm 26 if uh, you're wondering <laughs> how old i am <laughs> wow that is quite a lot of education experience you have under your belt habibi is only is it 26 years old yeah 
26 years old, um, has, is from Sheffield, has studied in Cairo for many years, does a lot of stuff around religious context. And it's a beautiful way to have somebody like Habib representing, I guess, um, Islam in a way of what he's teaching and his learnings in that respect and how he ties it into the British context. And I guess you're the perfect person to speak about identity where you're from an environment um, in England, Sheffield, gone to Cairo. How was it like for yourself then, getting to know yourself and your identity? Uh, I think when growing up, um, everyone has a an urge to sort of find out who they are you know there's there's mm-hmm. always this sense of belonging that we all urge and and have a feeling to feel you know like we always want to belong to something somewhere and when we don't find that we can f- find it very difficult to be ourselves or find you know peace and tranquility within our hearts so growing up as in uh, i come from uh, a south asian background, my parents are from Bangladesh, they moved over uh, 25, 26 years ago, uh, and then obviously I was born uh, in the British context. So then you had a balance between uh, living up, uh, I mean, growing up in a, in a Bengali household, uh, and then obviously trying to acclimatize to the British context. So you had that kind of battle going on as well. Uh, and then at the same time, what you do is you're always trying to um, see the bigger picture in trying to connect to Allah Almighty and who you are as a Muslim. Um, Mm. So these are your three sort of main aspects as to trying to figure out who you are as an identity. But identity is one of those things which is multi-layered. There's so many things that contribute to who you are. Uh, And it can be little, very little things. For example, I might support a certain football club. So I I support Arsenal Football Club. (laughs) Uh, One of my identity, uh, part of my identity is that I support Arsenal Football Club. And that can differ to someone who supports Liverpool FC, for example. Um, (laughs) So, so I mean, it's it's a, it's a big deal. Identity is a big deal, um, yeah. and as we as we mentioned uh, the the last time we had a podcast, um, the saying that whoever knows himself knows his certainly knows his Lord, uh, mm-hmm. and part of the spiritual understanding of who you are is that Allah Almighty is the one who put you on this earth, right? Mm-hmm. And every identity that you have uh, should have a pathway to reminding you that we are on this earth for a purpose and that purpose is to uh, serve God um, and uh, and his creation you know um, so that's that's the main thing about identity um, and when you have these sort of things going on then things like marriage for example can can you know make can amplify certain things uh, can amplify the good and can amplify the bad as well and that's why it's very important to figure out who you are myself, um, I was sort of uh, encouraged by my parents to go into this line. Um, obviously, when I went to the boarding school um, and I was there for like five years, um, afterwards is obviously when the real imam training starts, um, right. after after 16 or 18. That's when the real training starts. But my parents sent me to a boarding school to sort of uh, protect me, I guess, from you know the ills of society, uh, in in our particular area, anyway. I mean, not every area is blessed with uh, with a good environment. Um, yeah. So I think my parents probably thought, you know, it's probably best that he goes to an Islamic environment where he can be praying all the t- uh, five times a day, when he can be reading Quran, and he will have access to scholars who have lived, uh, you know, in the British context yeah. while also balancing uh, their parents' heritage as well. Um, so I think. My parents contribute towards that. My teachers especially uh, contribute towards figuring out who I am. And Mm -hmm. uh, in Cambridge, actually, uh, we used to do these personality tests. um, And we had a personality personality test and uh, just to help with your career, where to go, what to do. Uh, One of my mentors, he asked me to do a personality test. And uh, judging by, you know, so I'm an... I'm an ENFJ, um, according to the pers- uh, according to the personality test, um, and then obviously there's a T and A afterwards as well. But ENFJ, uh, and he said that you you will suit the role as an imam, 
or right. the imam role will suit you, just your personality. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I was looking to be an imam per se. I was just looking to obviously learn uh, the religion and obviously try to help other people. But it so happened to be that the the way to help people would be best through being an imam in the community. And and it sort of materialized uh, a couple of years back in two uh, four years back in 2017 when I joined uh, Dunfermline Central Mosque. And and I think we did pretty well actually uh, as a community. It's a very small community, but I think we did quite well in trying to progress certain things that were previously deemed, I don't know, backwards or whatever else. Um, and, and actually, if you look at the Femme Central Mosque now, um, if you hear about it, uh, even though it's small in size, they've done uh, way more work or way bigger influence and impact on the community, especially the non-Muslim community, actually, um, mm. than other big mosques that you see. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably contributed to my identity as becoming an imam and serving people uh, through through Islam, I guess. I guess in modern society as well, we have a lot of philosophers and psychologists like Carl Jung, um, we've got Descartes, we have the legendary Freud who speak about the self and the identity and it goes into a very deep layer of finding out who you truly are. And what you said there, some beautiful things, is how you're connecting yourself to Allah and how we as individuals see ourselves. And you seem like a very calm, collected, you know who you are. And a lot of people go through these identity crises, not knowing, not, not being able to navigate um, or actually giving themselves a chance to find who they are. And I say this because I feel like where we have so many, and correct this if I'm wrong, it's from my experience on working with people, where we have so many identity caps, being South Asian, being Muslim, being British, trying to you know, carry on our parents' heritage, that we struggle with this word maybe sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, like I said, it's... Uh... Identity is uh, it's, it's, a, it's a word that we all throw around very easily, but it's, it, it takes hard work to figure out who you are. And it's not yeah. very easy to figure out what your identity is. And because there's so many elements and layers to it, um, yeah. to work out who you are means that you have to evaluate and reflect on every aspect of your life uh, and see, am I, am I being me in this particular aspect? Am I am I doing the best I can in this particular aspect, or you know, is this person serving me well? So please join us after the break, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Welcome back to another great episode. I'm yeah. serving my interests uh, to, you know, to do well uh, in my studies or in my work or even in our, in my personal connection to Allah Almighty. So, uh, yeah, I mean, identity is thrown around like that as uh, as a as a as mm -hmm. a trendy word. Maybe sometimes, you know, this is my identity. This is who I am. But some a lot of the times when people make a claim that this is my identity what tends to happen is because of certain circumstances uh, around you at that particular moment, that has allowed you to figure out who you are, actually a minute part of yourself, right? Mm. So for example, for example, when we talk about uh, the Salman Rushdie uh, affair uh, back in the 1990s, a lot of the way people, uh, you know, uh, one of the most particular ways that South Asian Muslims used to identify themselves uh, as were South uh, as Asians. You know, we are Asians, right? So everywhere you'd see lots of Asian clubs, Asian organizations, 
you know, trying to do their best to cater for our own people. But mm. when the Salman Rushdie affair happened and, and Islam was now under, you know, uh, scrutiny, um, not just from the Muslim community, but also the wider community itself, then suddenly we're not Asian, we're Muslim or we're Muslim yeah. Asian. You know, yeah. so certain contexts uh, also contribute towards how you define yourself. And yeah. even then, it's still it's still a part of yourself. And just because you've identified one part of yourself doesn't mean that you've identified everything about yourself. And there's still a lot more work to do. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And it's very insightful that you said that. And it's almost understanding that identity changes. And given the time and the context that we are in and who we are around. And I think that leads me beautifully into actually also stating that we're talking about marriage and how to retain our identity in a marriage, but it's also important to understand the background of what identity means for each one of us. And I hope this conversation for the viewers that are tuning in is thought provoking, that you take time out to find out the different compartments that you play a role into it. as um, Heavy was saying, we are forever changing, we're forever evolving and growing as well. So before we carry on, Heavy, thank you so much for that. We will be going on our first break. And if you have joined us, we are speaking about retaining your identity in a marriage. I would love to hear from you to find, find out actually, has your identity changed from the time you are single? And how did it change when you got married? What did you compromise in? Because our identity when we're single to when we're married is two different things and it might be a shock. We are speaking to Imam Habib on retaining your identity during the chapter of marriage. We would love to hear from you. Um, before we went on break, we discussed what is identity? What does it mean to us? What does it mean in the Islamic context and the Western context? And I would love to hear from you, particularly if you are struggling with your identity maybe, or like I said before, if you felt like you had to change your identity for being a single person and changing your identity or yourself in marriage. What are the pros and cons and what advice can you give to us? Please make sure you tune in and uh, message us on 07585835150. Going back to Imam Habib. Salaam alaikum Habib, are you still there? Wa alaikum salam, yes I am. Yeah. We were speaking a lot about in terms of um, finding ourselves as well um, through the lens, I guess, of Islam and then being in the Western society where we are brought up in a very different way through parents that were first generation immigrants. Do you think it's fair to say that most of our identity crisis comes from the way we were probably brought up? from people or parents that didn't really know about this word identity because they were just thrown into it, marriage, survival um, tactic, uh, bringing up children, bringing up a family, and it didn't give them a chance maybe to look at who they were. And that has had maybe repercussions on the generation after. No, most definitely. I think it played a huge part into how things are now with the you know upcoming generations with the current generation even but i think in terms of uh what you said in terms of they didn't really focus on identity or didn't know what identity was i would argue that they did um mm. it's just that they had a different take on what their identity was mm. so if you if you try to see it their way is that they were bangladeshi they were pakistani they were indian and they were sort of forced to leave their homes and, 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 and villages in an attempt to make their life better. Um, mm. And so when they went to a place that was very alien to them, the only way that they could identify themselves is through what they were, you know, brought up with. And that's, a, you know, that's what um, they were brought up with back home. And they felt that in order for them to not lose themselves, in trying yeah. to better their, themselves in, in the process, uh, they felt that they had to hold, uh, keep hold of who they were. And that's why they had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of interest in, 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 what, in what was going on in Pakistan, for example, the politics in Pakistan, uh, you know, who's the prime minister, who should be, 
be voting that still continues because you know they they in their mind or subconsciously they feel that they're Pakistani and they don't really fit in to Britain because that's not who they are and that's not where they belong but they they're just having to be here because like you mentioned survival mode they had to survive mm. uh, and that's why they left their home country so i feel that uh there's there's two ways of looking at it i don't disagree with the fact that you said they didn't have much uh focus on who they wanted to be themselves i don't disagree with that because they were sort of forced into survival yeah. mode and, and therefore that contributed to not figuring out who they are as a person and yeah. and that that maybe generational trauma continues that mm. our kids later on they don't really know who they are either you know mm. because our parents never knew who they were and they yeah. only taught us to do certain things and that's why we do these certain things and we haven't really explored who we are and and developed as a human being uh, as well so i yeah. i totally agree with that point but yeah. i also you know like to bring in the fact that you know that was also the identity in, a, in a, you know in a sense as well um, yeah. so i mean it's it, there's two ways of looking at it um it depends yeah. how you want to look at it no absolutely we always have to have a perspective on our own thoughts and understanding what other people's perspective are and you said something really interesting then um exploring our identity which leads me to ask you like in today's society especially within our muslim community the south asian community Oh god let's go to the south asian community because it's unfair to say the muslim community there's so many different cultures and everything so mm-hmm. it's a south asian community that i work with the most and i hear a lot of females struggling with keeping retaining their identity one where they become mothers fathers they become parents you know you're now leaving behind your single life you're now leaving behind your bachelorette life bachelor life you now have responsibilities and a lot of marriages are failing or shall i say going through a lot of crisis where mm-hmm. divorces are happening where we have a lot of single female um looking after children by themselves looking to get married there's a lot of stuff going on do you i mean in my opinion i feel like a lot of people don't know who they are before they get themselves into a marriage i feel like there's a lot of pressure that goes on because of society expectations cultural expectations parents pressures and everything so this word coming back to identity can it be one of the reasons why there are so many divorces happening i, in your I think opinion? it's probably Yeah, I think it's probably the one of the key reasons actually. Um, you know, you mentioned obviously there's multiple reasons as to why a marriage can fail uh and why or, or even if it doesn't fail, you know, it can have, it can have a lot of rough patches within the marriages. Um but definitely for me one of the key reasons is that because people don't know who they are and if you don't know who you are as a person, you're not going to know who you want, you know, yeah. uh, in a spouse. right and what tends to happen is because of societal pressure cultural expectations uh or you know we need to get married at a certain age we need to get married to a certain background or we need to get married to a certain you know caste system or whatever else you know these these sort of extra things that come in uh do contribute to that um in in rushing into marriage actually um mm-hmm. and even uh like and a lot of people even when it comes to marriage they don't really know what the rights are even even the basic rights of what a husband yeah. and wife you know and so not just a sort of cultural or societal expectation um there's no sort of religious sanctity anymore to marriage it's just like yeah, yeah just need to get married we just need to tick a box but yeah. the whole point of marriage is that it's a sacred thing which is supposed to lead you back to Allah Almighty which is supposed to lead you back to God and um the verse in the Quran Allah Almighty says and among his signs in this is that he has created you for uh, for you mates from among yourselves that you may dwell in tranquility with them and he has put love and mercy between your hearts verily in that are those uh, are the signs for those who reflect 
you know mm. that's the whole point of marriage you know that a marriage is supposed to be something that you have peace and tranquility and peace and tranquility comes from Allah Almighty so if you associate yourself and surround yourself with peace and tranquility with, with its nature or with its people who remind you of God that will automatically lead you to God it's supposed to be a spiritual experience right marriage mm -hmm. but marriage has just become a, a social construct nowadays right mm -hmm. um, the, the social construct or the political aspect has taken over the spiritual aspect of marriage and that's mm -hmm. why I feel when because knowing yourself is a spiritual thing like, because if you go back to that saying knowing yourself uh, leads to you know certainly knowing God so when you take that spiritual element out of marriage, then you face a lot of problems uh, with yourself, uh, trying to figure out who you are. If you are now a father, if you are now a mother, you know, uh, and even like even even trying to understand what does it mean to be a mother or father, you know, is it just that I have a child and that, that's it, I'm a mother, or that's yeah. it, I'm a father? No, this yeah. is more than that, right? Having a child is also a trust that Allah Almighty is giving you, yeah. right? Uh, it's a responsibility, it's an amana, and that in itself should connect you to Allah Almighty as well. You know, so yeah, we've, yeah. I think what happened is we've sort of neglected uh, our understanding of what marriage is, what it should be, uh, and therefore because we don't know ourselves, we don't know what we want, and we don't necessarily know who we want, and we're just marrying for the sake of marriage. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, uh, marriages aren't as successful uh, as they should or could be. Beautiful. On that note, we're going to take another break. And have you said so many beautiful things? Marriage has become a social construct. Um, we're not following the guidelines of Islam. So join us um, for the second part of our conversation and see you in a bit. Members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. With 3 million members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Welcome back and we are going to go straight in um, to our topic about retaining our identity in the chapter of marriage. Um, I want to quickly bring something up, um, a strong sense of identity and self-worth. A classic study done by Berger and Kellner in 1970 demonstrated that entering a marriage, a relationship requires the reconstruction of an identity that is that needs to be achieved by both people in that relationship, they need to reconstruct the past identities to define a new relationship identity. So Habib, um, coming back to you, how important is it then to reconstruct our identity as Muslims when we enter the next chapter? I mean, uh, in Islam, we're encouraged to continuously grow, you know, continuously grow, continuously improve ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's in terms of character, whether in terms of, you know, what we want to achieve in life, Islam always encourages to seek knowledge, for example, and that's a, a way to develop who you are as a person. Islam always encourages for you to, you know, go out and do things, right? And so, you know, reconstruction of our identity is very important in that sense because all of these things contribute towards that. Um, and I don't feel it's a total reconstruction of your identity. I think it's just an, another, you know, another version of you, like a 2.0 version of you or a 3.0. It's, mm -hmm. it's an improved version of yourself because for me, marriage is something, uh, it's a means and a tool to enhance who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And usually when you're single and you're trying to, you know, achieve the best that you can, you're doing it alone, you know, it's a lonely path sometimes. Marriage is supposed to be someone, something where you're trying to achieve your goals, but now you have a partner that can help you achieve that. And uh, and if you have the right partner, if you have a partner that supports you 
or has faith in you or accepts you as who you are, then you can achieve your goals even quicker. And actually, you might even achieve uh, certain things that you probably didn't imagine before. Um, so yeah, reconstruction of your identity is very important in that sense, and and part of that reconstruction involves, um, you know, your other half, um, because yeah. they can they also contribute towards uh, you becoming a better person, um, hopefully. Yeah, that just made me think about something actually, where you just said um, you're meant to enhance one another. And as individuals, we come on a baseline of our physical enhancement, our spiritual enhancement, and our mindset enhancement. And then when you, when you, as human beings, we're here, and then the partner is meant to bring you up all the time. So you're always learning, not going down, or that person pulling you down. Um, so that's really important to understand as well, based on what you just said. And then the second thing is, when you were talking, I just thought about couple goals. Couple goals, you know, you become, you grow together, you learn together, you evolve together. But social media has a huge impact in uh, identity and how we see marriages nowadays as well. And I think it's a horrible, horrible false illusion that we see through our phones, that it takes us away from the main concept the main understanding of what real marriage is about going from what you were saying about islam you know teaches us how to love one another islam teaches us about how to grow together in a marriage and what to look for and everything what's your opinion on this uh again it's, uh, it's exactly as you said it's important it's so and so important you know uh, i mean the way i see it allah almighty also explains marriage um, or like they've dis Allah Almighty has also described a husband and a wife as garments for each other, and, and you know, like a garment for someone mm. uh, or for something is is such a beautiful way of putting something um, as to who you should be for the other person. Um, so, in terms of being a garment for someone, what you, are you doing? You're offering protection, you're offering comfort, you're offering someone warmth, a home, you know, uh, within that yeah. other person, uh, and. Allah Almighty, when he talks about garments, he talks about the best garment being uh, that of God consciousness, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we've become as as a society is not conscious of God, but conscious of what other people will say. Um, and and we try mm -hmm. to follow trends, you know. And 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 yeah, social media does pay, play a big part in that. Social media sort of says this is what a happy marriage looks like and most of the time social media doesn't even highlight the struggles that you may go through right yeah and so the expectations of marriage again is constructed in a way where you feel that if something that you've seen on social media isn't happening in your life that yeah. means your marriage is failing when in reality yeah. you might have it better than the person who's put something up on social media you might yeah. even have it good and and, yeah. and Unfortunately, you've allowed yourselves to miss that, uh, and uh, and and in a sense, you lose yourself uh, mm. through social media. You lose who you are, and therefore, when you try to depict yourself as that couple in in on social media on Instagram, you try mm. to be more like them. So your yeah. marriage is quote unquote successful, and in yeah. doing that, you've you've lost who you are. You you don't know who you are anymore. You've hit the nail on the head on so many things you said there. And this is, especially to the young people that want to get married quite early on, it's important that you tune in and listen to this. There's so much knowledge here to, that we can actually advance ourselves to learn and to grow and actually understand the real meaning of who we are. To get to know yourself is hard. And then to get to know yourself in a relationship with another person um, is harder. Um, thank you so much um, for that, Habib. I wanted to go straight into the next question then. Um, sure. It's important that we are true to ourselves. It's important that we retain this identity. So how, in your opinion or your advice, would you say then um, how not to lose the identity in a marriage or avoid <laughs> losing identity in a marriage? Yeah, I, th I, th I think um, there's two aspects to it. One is obviously growing into 
uh, your new identity, so to speak. So now you're not just a single guy or a single girl. You're you're a wife now. You're a husband now, right? Uh, and part of you know part of your identity in a marriage is embracing a new aspect to your life, a new chapter, right? Mm. But also at the same time, you also want to be yourself as well. Um, and I think this is just, a, I mean, this is just a general sort of advice as well. Um, the things that you were doing while you were single, uh, which made you happy, which made you whole as a person, that shouldn't stop right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, marriage is supposed to be something that enhances your experience and, and tries to help you achieve more of your goals. So if you were, I don't know, if you were doing uh, a weekly class of, I don't know, Taekwondo or something, uh, and, and you felt that you needed to do this one for obviously your safety, but also at the same time, you found a bit of peace and, 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 and a means to release, you know, bad energy. So you can always be in a, in a in a positive mindset or a positive uh, mood um, if for example you get married and that stops uh, then you have lost who you are as a person mm -hmm. then when it comes to dealing with stress in marriage because you don't have an outlet anymore that you used to have that used to work very well for you then that will be projected everywhere onto your spouse, uh, onto your surroundings, and you're just going to have all this negative vibe and energy within the house, and you won't, you're won't, you not going to have a place to release that, right? Yeah. So one of the advice that I would give is whatever you are doing, um, you know, continue doing that. And I know people talk about compromise uh, in, in marriage. I mean, uh, in everything, pretty much you have to compromise. You can't get everything that you want, right? Yeah. That's That's, 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 you know, uh, valid um, advice. But there's one thing that you shouldn't compromise is that you shouldn't compromise on who you are, right? So yeah. if you need to go out and do a class, a physical exercise, then yes, sometimes you might need to cater for your husband or your wife uh, and, and maybe postpone or, or miss a class maybe once here and there. That's fine. I mean, and it happens, right? But if you're doing it con continuously to meet the needs of your other half, what tends to happen is the the relationship becomes more of a codependent relationship, uh, and when that happens, that has real risk of only one person in the relationship being fulfilled, and the other person, uh, you know, missing out, and the other person actually too focused on, you know, serving the needs of uh, the other, and when that happens, it just becomes a toxic cycle, you know, of um, you, you know, you need to do this for me and okay, yeah, I will do that for you. And then when it doesn't happen, then yeah, why not doing that for me? You know, it becomes really messy in that sense. So definitely, definitely do continue to do what you were doing previously. And and maybe even if you want to enhance it, maybe why don't you go to the same class together? I don't know, maybe that could be something more fun, something more uh, beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know, maybe it also depends on your personality as well. If you're the romantic type, then maybe, yeah, you would want your other <laughs> half with you in the class. Although other people don't want that. Other people want their own personal space, right? Yeah. So you need to figure that, out, figure that out whether you are that kind of person or not uh, yeah. before, you know, trying to get others involved. Is um, there so many? Yeah, you go on. <laughs> You said so many beautiful, uh, beautiful things. That's really enriching as well. Like, let me just summarize <laughs> how to keep your identity, how to avoid losing your identity in a marriage, do the things that you're doing, give each other space, maybe do things together as well. And it's really important that we take note of that. That's part of your self-care. Everything starts with self, self-worth, self-confidence, self-esteem. And just going off what Habib said, um, I feel like sometimes a lot of us feel like we're losing our freedom when we go from the chapter of being single to being <laughs> married. But there has to be a leeway of how we adapt. I think that's a key word, isn't it, as well, Habib, adapting to your new lifestyle. No, definitely. Uh, adapting, uh, evolving, you know, where, or the, whatever other synonyms you want to use that, you know, says the same meaning. Yeah, adapting is, is pretty much on point what, you, what we're trying to get out here. Um, embracing yeah. the new you and also, you know, uh, you know, enhancing who you were before. So, yeah, adapting to every situation. And yeah. I think one of the key things in order to be able to adapt 
is, uh, and I think this is very, very important, is that whatever uh, traumas that you may have had, um, you need to make sure that before you go into a relationship, um, especially when it comes to marriage, um, and, and, and you want to sort of maintain the sanctity of marriage, you don't want it to be something that you don't look forward to when you come back from work, oh yeah, I need to... Happy, yeah, need I'm to gonna... Go. And I'm going to stop you there for our last break. Please join us and we would love to hear from you. So ring us and let us know your thoughts and your opinions. See you in a bit. searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors single muslim live with three million members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors single muslim live Welcome back to the last segment of the show. I'm going to go straight back to Habib. Um, you, you were saying something so beautiful then, and it was about adapting. And you were saying something about um, coming into the relationship, looking forward to it and not dreading it. Yeah, so, I, I mean, uh, yeah, adapting is a key word uh, in, in marriage. Um, but also at the same time, uh, what I wanted to sort of head towards is part of adapting is... Um, understanding that the problems you have now or th the problems you had before can now be shared to someone, right, with someone. Uh, and it's not something that you want to dread coming back from work or coming back from school or wherever, from university, wherever else. It, it's supposed to be something that you look forward to. And I think you can only allow yourself to do that if you have, um, uh, like, everyone has trauma in, 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 in different ways, you know, everyone has gone through difficult moments in their life. And what you don't want to do or end up doing is that uh, whatever you went previously affects your future, right? Mm -hmm. So part of part of adapting and part of trying to find ourselves is also healing from any particular issues that we may have had in our childhood or, you know, anything uh, traumatic that happened to us, uh, whether it's an accident or whether it's, you know, uh, a, relation, a previous relationship or an experience, uh, you know, we tend to have tr uh, trigger points, you know, in certain uh, cases. Uh, and that's something very important to uh, deal with. And it's not the case that you're going to heal completely and then go into marriage, but you all, but you, but you need to be in the process of doing that continuously, uh, especially when you're looking for a spouse and going into a relationship, uh, especially uh, for marriage. Um, because, like I said, marriage is supposed to be something that brings that peace and tranquility within your life, right? And mm -hmm. It's a two-way thing. It's a two-way relationship. It's not that other person is going to bring that for me. You have to do the same for them as well. And if you 100%. haven't, yeah, if you haven't healed from previous things that might contribute towards the toxicity or or the negative aspects mm -hmm. uh, of who you are, then it's not going to work. It's not going to appreciate the person that is is you know in front of you. Yeah. I think relationship is one of the biggest money-making businesses out there. Um, we can talk about lawyers, solicitors. We can talk about relationship coaching. Everybody needs a guideline. And we have our own intuition that will tell us what we need. And I think knowing there's a test that everybody can do online that is learn your love language. How do you want to be loved? And then treat yourself like this. Love yourself in your love language. And it's important. Not a lot of people know about this because it's not been taught to them. But if you learn about your love language, it just saves so much trouble in communicating with your partner. And there's a fascinating um, thing I read on this. Um, a, a Japanese man got married, I don't know, maybe to a Swedish lady. And they were speaking in two different languages. She was telling him that she loves him and he was telling her that she, he loves her in their own languages. 
But because there was a breakdown of understanding the languages, they started thinking that neither of them loved one another because it's two different cultures, how they show mm -hmm. love. So in our society, we have so much resources, so much tools out there as well. I'm going to go to a question that was sent to us by a viewer. First, thank you so much, Habib. I'm really enjoying this topic Welcome. speaking to you today. Salam to Nazi Katun and Imam Habib Khan. Thank you for the show today. I think a good way on way on retaining your identity during the chapter of marriage is to work with your partner every day as it is as this is important. A question for the Imam. How long does it take to be a how long does it take to be a, a Imam? Sorry. So how long does it take you to be an Imam? Uh, okay, so uh, I, I was I was thinking it was going to be a question related to the topic, but okay, yeah, but that's a nice question as well. I mean, it depends. Um, uh, some people go through training. Uh, I mean, the seminary that I went to had uh, a three-year program, had a five-year program, had a six-year program. Um, I went through a five-year program. Uh, on top of the five-year program. I also went to, you know, um, uh, a year diploma in Cambridge uh, Muslim College where I did uh, contextualizing Islamic studies and leadership. So it was a, it was a pretty much sort of designed to train imams in that sense. So I think in part, in, in, to answer your question, I think I did pretty much six years of official training. And obviously, uh, as an imam, it's my duty, my personal duty and obligation to continue evolving, continue adapting. So uh, you probably find me doing, attending courses, attending events that imams probably wouldn't necessarily have to attend, but I'm going to attend because that's going to help me help you in effect. So, yeah. Um, and on that note, um, Habib also just started a new podcast. Tell the viewers about your podcast and what they can expect from that, actually. Uh, no, thank you for bringing that up. So yeah, part of my uh, work um, is also provide is also to provide healthy, authentic, genuine, real, deep conversations. You know, and I feel that sometimes when we talk on a topic, um, we talk from one particular angle, maybe, or we miss out on a lot of things that we can uh, make a conversation more holistic. You know, because people come from different backgrounds and people can learn something from a particular topic if different angles are covered. So that's why I came up with a podcast called Holistic Conversations uh, and Khan as in K-H-A-N uh, as in my name. So I, I basically made it into a pun, uh, so to speak. So yeah, Holistic Conversations, the Imam Habib podcast. Um, so that's something that we are trying to do regularly every Mondays. Uh, Nazia was my first guest and I was so honored that she accepted my invite. Uh, the next one uh, is uh, on Monday coming up uh, by Shahida Rahman. We have her from Cambridge. Um, she's going to be, and the title of that episode is Rewriting the South Asian Story. So it's, it's, it's funny that today's topic is about identity uh, and, and because a lot of us are from the South Asian background, we are going to be talking about her life story and journey and, and how we fit in as South Asians in Britain. So maybe that's a topic that you probably might be interested in. Um, so yeah, and and the way I want to go about this is that it's not necessarily scholars that I'm going to, you know, bring in imams and, and so to speak. Uh, I want to bring in people from different backgrounds, different traditions and, 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 and expertise, you know, to give that element of, you know, a whole yeah. a wholesome element. Yeah, so make sure you follow Imam Habib Khan and Holy Set Conversations. I'm just going to go, there's so many questions here for you, Mr. Imam. Um, the other one is, um, where is it? So, are you single or married now? <laughs> uh, I myself, I'm not married, I'm single. Um, okay. So. <laughs> are you, uh, have you used single Muslim app? And what are your best ways to find a partner from your own experience and knowledge? And is finding a partner difficult in your opinion? There's a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I'm going to try to be as uh, concise as possible. Um, uh, in terms of if I've used the app, I've not used the app uh, in that sense. Uh, and to be honest, I've, I've just been... Uh, 
quite busy with my own sort of work and studies um so i've i've sort of focused more on that um so yeah so i've not i've not really sort of tried out different methods of you know looking for a, a partner in that sense but mm. as an imam you also have experiences of people you know asking advice about how to go about finding a spouse um so yeah i mean there's many ways of finding a spouse you can do it through um your parents for example um uh, your parents might know certain people and you know you can get together and get to know each other uh, and then decide for yourself whether that's something that you want uh singlemuslim.com uh, or even apps that we see today uh yeah. i mean yeah i mean i mean i have had a lot of success stories i have heard a lot of success stories uh, actually yeah. uh, one of one of the people that i knew uh back in scotland actually met online uh, she was from birmingham he was from scotland and you know wow. they met online they really connected and when they met up and they met with the families you know it went really well and they just had recently their second kid um so yeah i mean uh, there's different ways uh, another way maybe is obviously and, I, and i've seen a lot of people do this as well like maybe they're not looking for marriage per se or a partner but they go to university or they go to a workplace and they realize actually you know there's someone that you know really uh, appeals to them and and you know you you figure out whether you like them or what you know what kind of person they are and then you figure out actually this is probably someone that I would want to share a whole life with and and then for you approach that person and obviously respectfully as possible uh and then you go about that way so there's many different ways of going about it and there are many success stories as well so um my advice is probably be if you are finding it difficult just you know try different ways uh don't just be one dimensional in trying to find a, a partner you know try different ways different methods get your friends involved uh i think the the bangladeshi have a certain way of doing it we have this bio data or a cv that we send out to people uh and yeah. then, you know people <laughs> and then you know connect that way so i don't know there's different ways but uh yeah. but if any, if anyone is finding difficulty I pray that you know Allah Almighty um, grants you someone very soon, someone that you can share a whole life with, and someone who can actually connect you to Him, uh, Allah Almighty, um, you know, as beautiful as possible, inshallah. Thank you so much. We're nearly coming to an end, and very quickly, um, Habib, what would be your top three ways to get people started on discovering the identity or finding the identity? We've got literally under a minute, so. Let's go. <laughs> okay, so yeah, top three things. Uh, I think um, do something that you've never done before. Um, that always, you know, helps you to explore and and develop yourself. Number two, uh, I think continue doing what you like, uh, what you've already found in yourself. And number three, uh, I think I think very importantly, heal from those things which are stopping and preventing you from uh, being better. Amazing. I love that. I think the fact that you put in healing is so important. It's so needed. Um if you don't know what you need to heal from, again go on that discovery to find out your identity. It all connects together. So thank you so much. We have actually come to the end of our show today. An amazing show, an amazing guest. Thank you so much for coming and joining us here on a Thursday evening. If you have any questions which you would like to put forward for next week's show, please do not mess please do message us. Sorry. Uh in confidence on 07950797017 for me Nazia Kitchen along with the whole team at British Muslim TV. Thank you for joining us and join us next week. Assalamu alaikum. Members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live.